my career advisor asked me, so what do you want to do? And I said, I want to work in space and I want to work in medicine. And she said, I have no idea how to do that. Dr. Dana Levin, welcome to E-Shadowing. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot, Ryan. How are you? I am doing great. I'm excited to chat with you uh, and nerd out about some aerospace medicine, some emergency medicine, get to check in with you, see how you're doing in New York City with COVID and everything going on as well, uh, joined by about 950 of our friends here as well. Um, I, I'm I'm excited to just jump right in and and get to your cases because you want to do cases and then we'll talk about your journey to emergency medicine, aerospace medicine, and go from there. What do you what do you say? That sounds great to me. Let's do it. All right. So I uh, I figure what we'll do is go through a couple of these cases. Unfortunately, because of the nature of the of the of the field I'm in, just like with any other medical field, we can't use specific cases because names and private information need to be protected. So what I've done here is put together a couple of cases that are pretty representative of what actually happens out there. And uh, we'll see how that goes through and you get a sense of what it's like, even if they're not the specific detail. So let's uh, one of these cases where you're the uh, flight surgeon for a group of training astronauts and pilots, and they're hanging out in one of these airplanes uh, traveling near the speed of sound. What is that? And uh, what'd you say? Is that a 38? That's a T-38. Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, NASA maintains a fleet of, of uh, T-38 training aircraft for their pilots. And these are used as to keep the pilots current and to get uh, the astronauts some training in high performance jets. These are supersonic trainers and they can seat two people, as you can see, two separate, it's two separate cockpits. But the, uh, so you're in this case, you're on the ground and you get a mayday call from the uh, from the uh, the aircraft where the uh, instructor pilot calls you and says, "Hey, you know, uh, hey doc, we're we're uh, we're doing some S turn maneuvers, which are these um, these very very uh, high high pressure high speed turns that uh, are designed to give people exposure to what it's like uh, to experience high G forces." And the instructor pilot notices that the that as the as the student was holding on to their the, to the aircraft's uh, controls and flying the plane, the plane suddenly uh, lost the turn and began to dive towards the earth. So the instructor pilot calls up the student on the intercom and says, "Hey, you know, what's going on? You okay over there?" And the student doesn't respond. So, pretty much. So you kind of think, did the guy fall asleep at the wheel? What happened there? Um, and I, and, uh, and for, uh, for all of these, you kind of, you kind of have to go through a little bit of an algorithm and understand, uh, what the environment is like. So it's not the typical patient interaction where you have, um, your, your patient up and, uh, and you're dealing with an unhealthy person, uh, who has come to you for assistance. What you're dealing with here is a healthy person because you know, they've been screened and, this person is now suddenly put into an environment that stresses them beyond their normal ability. So we have to go through their algorithm and think, is this somebody who has a sickness that I need to be aware of? Uh, did something happen in the aircraft? I know that at least one of the pilots is okay, so it's probably not depressurized. Um, and I know that uh, I know who the pilot be because I'm the flight surgeon on call. I know all the, all the astronauts. We know who's in the air. So, you got to go through it, and you notice that um, then by the time you're thinking through this algorithm, the student pilot's starting to come around and respond. And so you start asking questions and say, hey, you know, how are you feeling? And they say, I I'm feeling okay, but I don't know what happened. Where am I? I, I you know, what's going on? And you, you explain that they seem to have lost consciousness and that their, uh, their instructor pilot has taken them back to the airport so we can get a full evaluation. But what this is, is really a, a case of, of something we call G-induced loss of consciousness or G-lock, mm -hmm. um, where if you are flying an airplane or if you are exposed in any way to high G-forces and you're pushing, pulling back on that, that control stick, all of your um, – you're basically increasing the force of gravity on your body. And as you can imagine, you know, your, your heart and – lungs and all of your muscles are designed to pump blood away from gravity up towards your head. Make sure your brain stays on. 
But if I increase the force of gravity without increasing some of those reflexes, I can pull all that blood back away from my head and overwhelm my heart's ability to compensate. So you end up passing out, which is exactly what happens in these cases. It's not that uncommon, but it, and it's something that we train pilots for. We actually, in some cases, put them in a centrifuge and spin them until they uh, until they achieve the until they actually do pass out, just so that they have a sensation of what it's like and they know how to avoid it before they get there. So, so, so I'm gonna. I'm going to turn your screen share off and I'm going to screen share something uh, just because right. you brought it up. And, and this is what I'm going to screen share right here. My my time uh, <laughs> in the centrifuge pulling nine G. Oh my, God. Uh, my wife, <laughs> at least I know what you're going to look like when you turn 90. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, the centrifuge is probably the best facelift you're ever going to get. <laughs> Yeah, the the G measles after were not very fun, but uh, <laughs> that that was. Fun. Oh man, no, not at all. Uh, the best thing is, I think I have a picture of that one from my perspective a little bit later on. Nice. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's G lock. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this kind of you've experienced this kind of thing. You know, you know a lot about these. Have you have you tell you've treated these patients before? Uh, I don't know if I've ever treated a G-lock patient, but but I, obviously as a flight surgeon in the Air Force, very familiar with G-lock, very familiar of, uh, with with kind of the recovery from that, and watching the fun the fun funky chicken videos, uh, oh, the yeah. body yeah. sit the floor video on YouTube. It, it, you can't get any better than that. <laughs> yeah, one of the things what he's talking about with the funky chicken is that a lot of these patients or a lot of these people when they experience this. Uh, your brain is momentarily starved of oxygen, so you have this kind of seizure response. And the common thing that happens is you get these ballistic arm motions, and they'll be flailing about. So it looks like the, the, the person is dancing. But the good news on this is it's not, actually, it's not actually dangerous, or at least no long-term effects from it. So the danger is that you lose control of the aircraft and you hit the ground, because it takes about 90 seconds to recover. But... Most of the time, the patients are doing, or the, the people recover fine. And if you're in an instructor scenario, the instructor is aware that this can happen. So this is much more common with students than um, experienced pilots. And we try not to put inexperienced pilots in a cockpit by themselves. Let me skip through the second one because I don't think it's going to be that interesting. But I want to show you. I want to show you a video here. This is one of our. Uh, this is a Heidi Marie. Uh, as you can read down here, it's Heidi, it's a Heidi Marie Stefanschen Piper, who was flying, who came back and was giving a speech just after landing in the shuttle. She was up there for I think about ten days during this mission, and I just want you to watch what happens here as uh, as she's giving her welcome speech. So we can't hear, but that's okay. We can just watch her. And <laughs> down she goes. Oh, man. <laughs> so, yeah, you can see that. I'm going to pause that video. Yeah, the audio in it is really not that important. It's basically her giving a speech, and then she uh, very slowly uh, or not so slowly begins to um, lose her train of thought, becomes more starry-eyed, and then collapses. So oh. at this point, uh, you have an astronaut that just came back down from space and is now – unconscious on the floor uh, in front of an audience of people. So this is a pretty dramatic experience uh, if you're not used to what's going on. And the audience there, when she stands back up, cheers. But again, now having talked her through the first case, you can get a sense of what might be happening here. Um, and if, you are, uh, if you've ever, if, if you've ever uh, spent some time lying down on the floor for an extended period of time or just get out of bed after waking up and then you stand up really quick, your body's kind of adjusted to being in that uh, flat state. And then when you suddenly stand up, another uh, it's another issue with circulation. Your blood ends up tending to pool towards your legs. So in her case, when she's standing up, that's what her blood is doing. But because she's been in space for so long, the reflexes that normally compensate for this aren't working. And she ends up passing out and falling down on the stage. And it's dramatic, but as long as she doesn't hurt herself in the fall, she'll recover okay. And the flight surgeons and other crew members who are standing on the stage with her are aware of this, and they get her back up and stand in okay in a, in a couple of minutes. But um, 
it was a dramatic event for the audience. So this is the kind of case stuff that we end up dealing with in the op- in, as in uh, in uh, space medicine a lot. But I figured, since I don't have too many pictures that I can show you of the actual events, I, I figured what we'll do is we could spend some time more uh, talking about uh, what I did to get to this place, like what I'm doing as a as a as a uh, as a as a medical doctor that works with NASA and in emergency medicine. I heard a good with um senator mark kelly former astronaut and and navy pilot talking about what it's like to be in space for the first little while just that because there's um there's a lack of gravity and your body doesn't have to fight as much to get all the blood back in the head but all the all the valves and everything still working just fine and he's like it's a constant like like it feels like you're standing on your head all the time because all the blood is just in your head yeah, well, that's that's what it is. You're uh, when you first get up there, your uh, your heart's again meant to push blood up against gravity, and you have all of these reflexes that will push blood against the force of gravity. So we've all grown up in that one gravity field, one G field for our entire lives, and when you suddenly turn that off, uh, your your body will continue to try to pump all that blood up ahead, up to your head. So the very first the very first time that it, people are in space, or for the first few days, they end up having uh, they feel like they're very congested. Their heads swell. They're visibly – their faces are bigger, um, and they they have, like, stuffy noses, and their eyes are puffy. They look like they have an allergy. And and, uh, and so a lot of the times we'll treat them with uh, with uh, decongestants to try to make them feel better. But over time, that, that extra puffiness and and, uh, and all of that goes away, at, and that's the – that's a, that's just a function of your body adapting to the environment that it's in, which is something that the human body is really good at doing. Um, within limits, but it's pretty good at it. So uh, just to give you guys a sense of it, this is a a picture of me uh, pretending to be a spaceman, which is basically still what I'm doing. But uh, this is the beginning, just like everybody else. And the thought that I wanted to bring up from here is basically that anybody, I think, who tells you that uh, it was a straight line that they planned out from where they started to where they ended up is basically just not telling the truth to you. Um, it's really easy to draw those lines in hindsight, but it's not so easy to do it going forward. So I've, I've definitely been in a, you know, I remember being in several points very uncertain about what was going to happen next in my world. And, um, yeah, and it, uh, it's, it's much easier to draw that straight line now than it was at those times. So even now, I don't know where I'm going to go in the, in the future, but I can tell you how I got to where I am today, which is, and uh, just to, cl- to to give you a sense of that, I, I work for uh, Columbia University Medical Center, and I spend uh, and and NASA buys a substantial portion of my time to work for them in in uh, spacecraft medical system design. So I I do a, I'm I'm basically a scientist, researcher, and clinician uh, at uh, that works based out of New York and working with NASA in uh, Houston. So. Again, about that that hindsight piece, but it all starts with some form of inspiration. For me, it started with some form of inspiration, and somewhere between when I was born and uh, and around the age of uh, where I started picking career paths, I got fixated on the idea of space travel. Um, and uh, and this is a picture from uh, a rock about two thirds of the way up Kilimanjaro, which is just to get a sense of the kind of sky formations you get out there, which is really amazing. But this is the kind of stuff that I got inspired by, and I was I was just enamored with the idea of it. So I decided to set my imagination and my sights on that. But the actual nudge that got me thinking about where I was going to go and how I would get there was um, uh, was me uh, was, uh, was me wandering around a little bit, trying to find my way through uh, trying to find my way through college. And around 2003, I uh, I was sitting in my um, on the, on the dorm room floor with painting my friend's wall and we were watching the shuttle Columbia land and, uh, it unfortunately never made it to the ground intact. Um, so if any of you guys ever look up the space shuttle Columbia disaster, what had happened was a piece of the external fuel tank had fallen off during the initial launch and cracked the heat shield so that when the shuttle reentered, um, they used the atmosphere to slow down. And the uh, and and in slowing down, it generates an enormous amount of friction. It's like rubbing your hands together at seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. It gets it's intense. 
So when they did that, they re-enter, generate enormous amounts of heat. The heat shield's cracked. It melts the frame of the spacecraft. Spacecraft falls apart, kills the astronauts. It was a horrible tragedy, um, but it it got me, it, it made for me, um, you know, after getting over the shock of watching this happen, it made me think about how real how real this was. It was no longer a pipe dream. It was a, a, a thing that people did. It was a real program. These were real lives that were doing space that were doing things as uh, as astronauts in space for real, and there was a whole group of people behind them. And now I'm watching what happens, obviously in a very sad moment. But I was watching what happens, and that was um, and that was a, a, a that was an inspiring point for me to look at it and say, not only does this this is not an imaginary thing, this is not science fiction, this is very real. So. I looked into it and I said, well, what can I do? How do I get involved in this? And I found that um, among my other interests, I had been kind of pursuing a, a pre-med track kind of loosely. And I was like, you know, maybe if I actually set myself in, into that, I could get into pre-med and go through the whole med school route and found that that was a qualifying field for, uh, you know, being an astronaut and that there were potentially some physicians that worked at NASA. So I said, why not let me try that? And I, and I, uh, so I ended up going through college. I applied to med school, and the first time I applied, I didn't actually get in. I had to, I had to go through a whole, uh, a whole post back program to do that again. Um, so that was one of those moments where I was, I, I was set back, didn't realize what was going to happen. But eventually, I went to Drexel, and and once I got there, I sat down with the career advisor again, not really knowing how to get through from med school to space uh, to the space world. And my career advisor asked me, so what do you want to do? And I said, I want to work in space and I want to work in medicine. And she said, I have no idea how to do that. But she <laughs> typed those into Google and came up with the Aerospace Medicine Association. So I literally just from a Google search that the career advisor handed me a printout of, that's where I got settled. So I talked to some people in that group and they recommended that I do some rotations with NASA. And I, I set that up in my last year of med school. I got a first badge where I got to go and take a look at the take a look at this, and then I was off. Uh, met my mentor, uh, met a couple of mentors there, stayed in touch, did some research, and spent a lot of time uh, listening to people about what I wanted to do. And the next, the next like major, uh, the first major lesson that I learned on this pathway was that I had to, to was to follow passions. So I was interested in space flight and I was interested in medicine and that kind of gave me a little bit of that that place to start but when it came down to getting out of med school and trying to figure out how to how to transition into a field where I work actually at NASA I had to make some decisions about um, what specialty I would want to choose and where to go so I had a real uh, a real struggle there because I liked a lot of the different specialties available to me and one of my mentors sat me down and said, here, let me give you the lunchroom test. And I was like, well, what's the lunchroom test? I, I hadn't heard about that one in any of my physiology classes. So he said, well, so let's check this out. You imagine yourself in a high school lunchroom, and there's all of these little crowds that are hanging out there. You got your theater kids. You got your you know, IT crowd. You got your sports, your sports jocks and all of them. And then over here, you also have your cardiologists and your surgeons and your EM doctors and all of those different different specialties. And I want you to think about you've got your tray and you're going to go sit down with this group and you're going to go and sit down with that group every day for the rest of your life. And I was like, well, that's terrifying. <laughs> imagine who you would want to spend some time with, like actually hang out with. So I started thinking about all the specialties as I did my rotations. I started thinking about specialties like that. and ended up finding that the people that I felt most at home with were the emergency medicine doctors. I love doing the work, but I really love the people in the emergency medicine world. And so the idea was I chose the people because they were the more interesting ones. I'm going to do the work, but I'm going to come home at the end of the day and I'm not going to be around I'm not going to be around the work all the time, but I will be around those people and especially in residency you're going to be around them a lot. So that's what I decided to do was I wanted to do emergency medicine. Let me and ask you a I took question. a chance. Dana, yeah. why why not with with your passion for this, why not join the Air Force, join the Navy and, and have that path right to NASA as a as a NASA physician? 
Yeah, that was a that's a really good question. It was a struggle for me. Um, the main reason I didn't do that is because my mother would have killed me if I. There, no, there was a real, there was a real moment where I was considering doing the Air Force or Navy route, but my mother, uh, my mother's thought was, um, "Do you want to be in the military? If you join the military, the military is that's 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 what you're doing, yeah. or do you want to be with NASA?" And I had answered, you know, if I had said I wanted to be in the military, she would have let me join the military. That's a a fantastic route, but really, my passion was not joining the military. It was to work in the spaceflight environment. Yep. And so she said, "Well." then why don't you go follow the route that you really enjoy? Do that. And I was like, hey, but, but, you know, if I'm in, if I'm in, uh, if I'm in the, the Air Force or the Army or the Navy, they'll have me fly uh, and train me directly in aerospace medicine. And then she was just not too happy with the idea of me being in the military. So I listened to her and ended up following a different civilian path. But um, the military is certainly a very, very viable way to get through that. And, and you've done that, Ryan. I know that that was your path, right? Yep. Yeah. So um, I I have a lot of respect for the Air Force people, but it, and and I I uh, there have been several points in my life where I th- I've considered uh, joining in, but uh, in in uh, in the way that things have worked out, it was just not the route that I took. And like I said, there's always more than one way. Yep. So in this case, I chose emergency med, and then I followed myself out to uh, to. I ended up going to a near Presbyterian, which is a, which is back in my home city after I was in Philadelphia for a while and ended up making a, one of the meeting, one of these, one of my first, uh, first attendings in this field was a guy named uh, Jay Lurie, who is a, turned out to be a good, a good mentor for me later on. But again, it was just somebody who I met on the interview trail who said, well, he asked everybody, why do you want to be in emergency medicine? And I said, because I want to be, I want to work for the for NASA. I want to be an astronaut. And he said, <laughs> "We should talk." And it turns out he had this passion. So he was. He ended up uh, leaving and going off to a different hospital not long after I got there. But we stayed in touch, and we, and that connection ended up being a really important mentorship for me later on. Uh, still is. I still work with him to this day. Uh, actually, he's now part of the same group I'm in at NASA. Nice. Um, but it was one of these. We didn't have any clue about this stuff when I was at you know just a you know, applying, applying to residencies. Um, so that's where, that's what happened there. And then at some point I continued to stay as close as I could to the aerospace world. So I, I went from, um, and here's, there's a picture of me and my, my simulator runs. Nice. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we did a, uh, so at some point I got involved in my research world and, uh, and, and in this, in the space research world, because I, I went and did some rotations in residency at NASA, stayed connected with some of the people that I'd met early on in my first rotations when I did that through med school. We wrote some papers, we did some uh, we did some experimentation in, in centrifuges and some training stuff. And through this, I ended up um, I ended up getting connected to the residency directors at the University of Texas and applying to um, and applying to the uh, residency there, which was how I ended up getting more directly involved with NASA. But that was the second lesson that I learned along the way is to not let school get in the way of my education, which, you know, it's a trite statement, but it's, it's somewhat true um, in that there are a lot of opportunities that you'll find that will open up because of where you are, whether that's in med school or in college or in high school, any of these places, there's tons of opportunities out there. And at any point, those opportunities are worth pursuing. Now you're going to have to select some. You can't do everything. But um, in this case, what I what I had done was I would I would pick out um, opportunities that presented themselves and basically say that seems cool. I'm going to go do that. So even if it wasn't a formal requirement, I had to do some extra work uh, later on. I would do a rotation that let me do a research project in Everest Base Camp. So I went out and. Uh, did some research in altitude sickness in my residency, and that meant that I had to do some extra work uh, later on. I had to use some of my vacation time to do it. But for me, it was worth the it was worth the time to be out there to really see the environments that I was going to be um, exploring or reading about, or these places that were so interesting to me. Um, I did the same thing with NASA. I went and did a rotation at at uh, at Johnson Space Center. Um, actually, in this point, it was at UTMB. 
because I was interested in learning about space medicine. Now that meant that I didn't follow the traditional paths and I didn't do my, uh, I had to, I had to make up some extra rotations in orthopedics because it was required. Um, but I, it was worth it to me to take those opportunities because that was what I was interested in. And that's what I wanted to learn about. So it was sort of a self-directed education. I learned to, um, instead of letting other people guide me the way that, a, the way that it's prescribed for you in a high school or college setting, you, you take these classes. I learned to pick the classes and pick the experiences that I wanted. But through that, I ended up uh, getting into residency in, aer- in aerospace medicine at UTMB and get, having some amazing, amazing opportunities where I, I got to hang out with the astronauts in neutral buoyancy lab. Um, and I was I've, given, I've I was been given some opportunities. Yeah, I'm sure you have. <laughs> Big swimming um, pool. It's a giant, <laughs> giant swimming pool. Uh, but I would, I would, uh, be, it would caution you about jumping in to do laps without permission. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, again, then I got some, and I had tons of other opportunities to do direct work. But even in this environment, uh, where there's a, it's a, it's a training program, it's formal, there's lots of opportunities to work in, in, uh, and for very prescribed courses. I still went out and tried to gain experience that seemed more uh, personally valuable to me. So I went to learn more about altitude sickness and more operational medicine. And because of my experience in Everest, I was connected with a group called Equal Playing Field. And we went out to Kilimanjaro and uh, I was the medical officer uh, that helped get these people to uh, play, to break the record for highest altitude soccer game. Oh. In a, as a as a way to raise awareness for uh, inequalities in women's athletics, so this group is a fantastic group of people uh, that the Equal Playing Field uh, organization. But I got to do that while I was in residency because I des- because this was an important thing for me to learn. I wanted to not just do training; I wanted to be involved in how do you plan this stuff? What do you do operationally? How do you take theory and make it practice? So I kept finding I kept finding these opportunities and I kept taking the taking these opportunities to go further. But through that, we also got to go to your old stomping grounds. This is a uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Nice. Um, got to fly some planes, uh, and then got to go to some really remote locations. Uh, this is a, a picture out from Antarctica, uh, where I met another mentor, uh, who was a, a, a man named a, a, a man named Eric Antonson who. who uh, works for NASA as well, and he he and I just happened to be out here and bonded over uh, being complete space nerds. And through that, I uh, I that later on became a very valuable uh, connection for me. But at the time, it was just us having a good time out in Antarctica while learning about uh, remote medical care and operational medicine in that field. Um, but then again, like I get out of I get out of the my residency. Didn't you know? I, I and you think you're you think you have all this momentum and you you got it made, but I applied for a job at NASA, and I was rejected. <laughs> um, it was a that was not my proudest moment. But just to give you guys just to give you the example that these things don't happen in a straight line. I you know when I what I didn't know um, at the time is that I had a lot of people that were trying to create a position for me. Um, because I because or and because of my particular interest, and so what they did is. They accepted my other two residents into a, into the position that was more appropriate for them, and the position that was more appropriate for me didn't exist yet. So, but they, I didn't hear all this, and even if it was told to me, I didn't get it. So, I I, I, uh, I ended up uh, you know uh, lamenting to one of my my uh, my astronaut friends out there, and he sat me down and told me a story that said, "Listen, you know, when I was when I was I had always wanted to be an astronaut, and when I." sat down to, uh, to apply to the Corps, and I, I started to go. He, this was a guy who did go through the Air Force, um, and he told me that um, when he did that, uh, he, was, he was initially diagnosed with a condition that was going to make it so that he couldn't be a pilot and he couldn't be an astronaut, and that was devastating. Uh, so he went, to, uh, went, he went home and he cried, and he... This is what this is the story he's telling me, and he said, "You know what? I'm gonna pick myself up after this, and you know, once I get that feeling out, and I'm gonna sit down and reassess what what I can do. Where am I? What are the options?" And so he then told me that he had always thought about going to med school, so he did. Went to med school, went through a whole 
a whole uh, a whole uh, you know the whole the whole shebang there. Ended up working for the uh, you know for the Air Force as a flight surgeon, and then uh, at some point along this, retested for the same condition and discovered that he didn't have it. Oh and no! He wasn't sure why he was taught that before, but he was like, "What?" So wait, you mean I could do this? I could be a pilot, but now now he's too old. The pilot thing was kind of out of the out of the picture. But he was like, but uh, astronauts not. So he applied and ended up getting selected as an astronaut because uh, nice. despite having been told that he was never going to get there. So he told me this story, and I was sitting there being like, thank you so much. I needed to hear this, and I was <laughs> such, it, I was enamored with this. Um, so that was a really valuable moment for me. I, I kind of picked myself up and took stock. And that was the, the next lesson I got was to be flexible. Um, so I took stock of where I was. And, you know, on one hand, I could look at it. At the time, I was 33 years old. Uh, I was unemployed. And I think, and I was living in my parents' basement. <laughs> Not a great setup. <laughs> that's, but, that's normal for everyone these days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, seriously, especially now. <laughs> but the other flip side to it was, Yes, I had these, but then I flipped it around and looked at what else I had with me. And I had, I was faculty at Columbia University. I was faculty at the University of Colorado. I had 20 years of training and experience. I was a published researcher, a unique skill set and connections to all of these different places. So I wasn't, it was deceptive. It made me feel, I was sad in the beginning and then looked around and said, well, what are my actual resources? Now, clearly, this is not where everybody's, everybody ends up landing, but I was very lucky to end up with this as in my background. But the concept is the same. You can always look at the negative side of it and tell yourself a, a story like that or flip it around and say, what assets do I have? What can I use to my advantage? So I ended up leveraging this, uh, became full-time at Columbia University Medical Center, and then worked with the University of Colorado to build up a couple of courses in uh, training engineers in, in space medicine. So that became a side project. That was the project that uh, my initial mentor, Jay Lemery, was working on. And so we were spending some time working on this. Um, and in the process of doing all of this, as it turns out, uh, NASA was also looking for some places that, for some people who would be able to do work translating medicine into an engineering field. So when they went to go look for people to do this, the first, pe the first people they chose were this small group of us over Colorado that were starting to do it um, kind of as a side project. So that project, they hired all of us, and we ended up all working in the same um, NASA and Exploration Medical Capabilities. So now that group of, of, uh, of people that I bonded with throughout, my, throughout this, this pathway that I didn't really think of as being particularly uh, important contacts ended up being the ones that got me a position doing the things that I really wanted to be doing. Um, and it was this kind of roundabout way. That's what, that's what it was. So the other, the other lesson that I got was uh, nobody ever does this stuff alone. So I did put a bunch of work and I definitely was, you know, this is a, I can, I can take credit for a lot of that, but I had a lot of help along the way. And some of that started with, I, I, you know, I had, I had family support. Uh, I came, I was very lucky to come from a, a very wealthy, privileged uh, family, but uh, I also had a bunch of mentors that pulled me out and guided me as I went along. And bottom line was I needed help to do this, but I also asked for it. And then when I, when I didn't get it, I kept searching until I did. So that's what I ended up doing. That's how I ended up getting where I was. So the, the lessons that I came out of this were uh, follow my passion, don't let uh, school interfere with your education, stay flexible, and that no one ever does it alone. So that was my uh, that was my basic the, the basics of all of this. And that says that you know when the next steps are a little bit foggy or you find yourself in a tight spot, uh, you don't just hang there. You you're waiting around for things to get better. You uh, take some time out, change your perspective. And uh, find some support from those around you. And I learned that if I keep myself flexible and work with the available resources that I have with me, I can get myself into some pretty cool places. So that's that's what I how I got where I am. Um, and I hope that that can give you, you all of you a little bit of a little bit of helpful advice going through it. But I don't know. That's Ryan, awesome. What's uh, what should we do now? Uh, I'm going to bring some students on, but right after I share one more picture here, uh, 
I don't know if I told you this last time we chatted. So I, I was stationed at Dover Air Force Base for the final space shuttle flight uh, wow. launched out of um, uh, Kennedy. Kennedy, yeah. <laughs> why, why? Yeah, I'm blanking. Uh, out of out of Kennedy at Dover Air Force Base was one of the the sites where if they had to abort the launch, um, they would they would fly to Dover and land. And so as the flight dock, I, I got to be part of the brief, uh, listen to the countdown on the radios, be out on the flight line just in case. And then it, once they passed the, the certain, I think it was two minutes or something like that. Um, I, I could go back to my normal day cause they were, they were doing their thing, which and is what I'm we wanted. Hoping everybody else can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? I got you now. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, that was a, a cool final, th- uh, thing that I got to do at uh, Dover air force base. So that is wild. That is absolutely wild. Um, all right. So let me bring on some students here who want to come on, ask some questions. You can, uh, click the speak to raise your hand looking thing. And I will invite you on to ask Dr. Levin some questions. I loved the one of the early things you said about that first case. One of the things that I learned about uh, aerospace medicine from the beginning was uh, normal medicine, right? Family practice medicine, whatever. It's it's abnormal physiology in a normal environment. Aerospace medicine is normal physiology in an abnormal environment. And how do you yeah. how do you take that that thought process? So I liked how you, you framed it there. Um, Thanks. That is, Mark. The tra- that, is, that is entirely the training. Yeah. Hello, Mark. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Danny, can okay. you hear him? I hear you loud and clear, Mark. All right. I just want to say uh, thank you for coming on. This has been probably the most interesting uh, e-shattering I've taken part of. Uh, I have been fascinated with space and medicine. It has been wondering if there's any possibility to try to connect the two, and um, here you are. So. Um, Here we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Glad to help. Is there, <laughs> is there any uh, possibility that you can just go through, like, in a sense, if you were to sum up, like, a day of work in your profession, um, like, what would you be doing? Um, like, is it more, like, in a sense, patient side, or is it a lot focused on research and the implementation of, like, medicine into um, space and, um, like, engineering and all that? Um, it's, a uh, the short answer that is sure try, but it's, it's very varied, uh, and it depends on exactly what your particular role is. So there's, there's basically three areas or four areas. There's, um, the operations group, which is patient focused. They're dealing with the astronauts. They're dealing with, um, answering questions that we don't, that we, whatever information's available. There's the research side, which is primarily, um, uh, meetings and forward thinking of preparing for what's next, trying to answer the questions we don't yet have answers to. Uh, there's an administrative side, um, and that's mostly uh, that's mostly like I guess that's really the third one. It's a, it's the administrative side, which is mostly uh, politics and writing writing various policies. So how do you interface with funding agencies, with leadership, with um, and and uh, and all of that. the vast majority of the day. Or the day-to-day is sitting in in meetings and interacting with various people trying to solve a particular problem. And most of the time, you're going to have more than one of these problems on your plate, so you'll have more than one meeting for the day. Um, the uh, on the operations side, I don't work on the operations side all that much. Uh, most of my work is in the research division. So, um, from my experiences as a resident, what we did in operations is we would end up having sort of a collection, a collective meeting once a week that gets everybody on the same page. There'd be a few people that were assigned to specific missions um, and they were, they were there to follow the crew. They were kind of like on call whenever the crew had an issue, um, which is not that often, uh, but you're involved in and answering questions or being their advocate when, you know, the, the schedulers want to give them like 26 hour days days. And you're like, Hey guys, there's only 24 hours in the day and they need to sleep. So a lot of that kind of advocacy, uh, but the research is mostly just is is a lot of uh, the research side for mine is is mostly meetings 
to establish a problem working with a group of people that are usually um, engineers, software designers, um, and, a, and a bunch of other interdisciplinary fields. And we are trying to solve problems that we haven't yet solved. So we'll be working on uh, using artificial intelligence to uh, support clinical decisions, or we'll be doing uh, how do you how do you shrink an ultrasound machine down, or how do you get an ultras how do you use ultrasound to move objects within the human body rather than doing surgery? Um, and we get to work with uh, people that are in working in uh, both within NASA and people that are in the private sector and people that are um, uh, students and residents and all sorts of stuff. And that's that's what that's like. So it's a lot of like it's a lot of meetings and a lot of like puzzle solving. If that makes sense. Yeah, nice. no, that makes perfect sense. Huh? Thank you so much. No, no Thanks, problem. Mark. Harjun, you turn your sound on. Hi, Dr. Levin. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, Harjun, I can't hear you very well. I'm sorry. The 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 thing is. Try speaking again. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, I got you. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, my name is Harjun. Um, I'm I'm a pre-med student. It's my first. I'm a freshman. Um, I like. I, I, so I I kind of took inspiration in like your integration of like space and medicine because I you know I I as I enjoy medicine, but I also um, like like that untold side of stories like. Italy during World War II, the Union during the Civil War, like, like that. So do you find that um, in your profession, you have like a lot of uncharted waters that you have to navigate? Like, of course, space medicine isn't like the most well-known, the number one um, specialty on most people's minds. So do you find that um, there's a lot of uncharted territory with like diagnoses and uh, treatments and such? Well, yeah. Um most of the field is a research, a research are effectively a very large, uh, well-funded research program. So everything we're doing is uncharted territory, uh, quite literally. Uh, we're sending people into areas that no one's ever been before, and we're trying to understand what happens when you're out there. So we've picked up a lot of knowledge based on our on our experience so far. But if you actually take the numbers, it's I think it's less than 600 people. Uh, on, have ever been in space, and that's the the sum total of everything. And all of the people had were very healthy and had very uh, had had and were very heavily screened and cared for. So there's a lot that we don't know about how uh, abnormal physiology interacts with space flight, or what happens when you're in a partial gravity scenario. We know what happens when you're in zero gravity because we have some experience there. But we don't know what happens when you're in partial gravity or when you go from zero gravity to partial gravity, like the moon or Mars. So there's there's tons of open questions. And that's basically what my work is, is we um, I, there's several elements and it's not it's very much not just me on this team. There are hundreds of people working on this, um, although not that many physicians. There's really only uh, probably about 12 to 16 of us that are working in the research division and they the the, uh, the whole goal of it is to try and figure out how to take that uncharted territory and move it into something that's known. So that's an excellent question, and that that's very much the field that I'm in. Thank you very much. You Thank, you. Thank you, Hannah. Um. Okay. So, can you hear me? I hear you. Okay. I was just checking. Um. So how is, I know you said you're in emergency medicine as well. Mm -hmm. So you're double sort of certified. Is that what it is or how does that work? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I am, I have two board certifications. Uh, one is in emergency medicine. That was the first one. And then I got board certified in aerospace medicine through UTMB. Uh, the way that that particular training flow works is uh, aerospace medicine in the civilian world requires you to have a primary specialty first. So I can't do just aerospace. I have to do internal medicine and aerospace or emergency medicine and aerospace or surgery and aerospace, something else that you have. And for me, I chose emergency, but my colleagues were family medicine and internal medicine. Uh, one of my other colleagues is physical medicine and rehabilitation. 
Uh, we have a, a an obstetrics and gynecology doctor that works on our team. Um, there's a number of it's any specialty can work into this, uh, and particularly we're interested in having different specialties in that field because the training is different. We need you know you, people there are, there are kidneys being sent into space, so we need nephrologists. There are um, there are there are hearts going into space, so we need cardiology. If we have to do any kind of procedural medicine like surgery, we need surgeons to inform how we would potentially do that. So it's it's a uh, yeah, that's what I did. It's that's my training flow. Wait, so if I understand correctly, like you go into space? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> we all wish. Because <laughs> you were saying that there's I, I like hearts, go, and no. you were saying that there's hearts and stuff that go into space. So I figured they'd send a doctor with that. Well, that's an interesting point. That's that's a really good point. Um, they should. Like human beings, yes, you you would think about sending a person into there, into space. But right now, if you think about where the International Space Station physically is, if there's a real emergency and we need to get somebody down from there, we can evacuate them, bring them to the hospital, and we can get them down within 24 hours. Now, if you have a rel- if you have very healthy people, the chance of needing to do that is very low, and the chance of them surviving if you do need to do it is pretty high. So we don't need to send a physician into space right now with the current structure. But as we start to send people up there for longer time frames or going further away, then we're starting to open up a question of, you know, how long do people stay healthy? What happens if you can't bring that person back? If it's going to take you a month to get home. Um, and what happens if you encounter a serious emergency medical problem or a serious chronic, chronic med- medical problem? And you and you need to care for it on site because you can't get them out. In that case, you need the expertise with the crew. So that's one of the big questions that we have to try to answer is whether or not you need a physician to do that, or if it can be somebody of a lower training level, uh, or if it, and if you and if you do that, if you send a physician and that's your that's your care provider, what happens if the physician is the one that gets sick? So we have to start coming up with all of those kinds of scenarios imagining what would happen and then imagining the solutions for it. That's really what my job is. That's the, that's the specific questions that I'm working on trying to answer. So right now it's all done by telemedicine. So when you have a, it's very much like what we're doing right now. You could be the astronaut on the station and you call down and say, Hey, my nose is stuffy. I've been in flight for a couple of days. Should I be worried? And I say, nah, it's fine. Take some Sudafed. That's what happens when you're in orbit. Um, and that's how this, that's how medicine is practiced right now. Um, although we do have some physicians who are astronauts, about a third of the core are astronauts. And actually, if you um, are following along with the uh, with the um, the newly named uh, Artemis uh, team, the, the astronaut, the 18 astronauts that were named to the Artemis program as the one as the people that will be going to the moon, I believe there are two of them, uh, Johnny Kim and Chell Lindgren, who are who are physicians. And so they're, they're not actively practicing, but they have that background training with them and they do fly in space. So I would love to go, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing that. I'm not selected in the astronaut corps right now. It Thanks, sounds Hannah. scary. Thank you. If, if you know, Dr. Johnny Kim, I, I want him on my uh, pre-med years podcast, talk about his amazing journey, doing everything possible to uh, live up to, Oh, the man. Asian parents um, <laughs> is, is yeah, phenomenal. Right. We, we, could, we could we could talk offline about how to how to get some of the astronauts on, but uh, uh, yeah, that's there. There's certainly ways to do that. That's yeah. They're they're all enthusiastic people. They they love doing this stuff. Yeah, Nick. Hey, for some reason I can't get my camera to turn around, so you're just going to see my shadow. Is that okay? <laughs> that's all right. Do do some shadow it's puppets fine. and see if we can guess. Yeah. It's like it's like you can see my hand, a human being. I promise. Um, so, uh, great to hear from you. I'm a huge, like, sci-fi nerd, so hearing you talk about just space just totally does it for me, so that that's awesome. I, I was just really curious about what it was specifically that got you interested in space in general. Like, that just seemed like to be, a, like, uh, just a um, an interest of yours way back when. Did you have some sort of, I mean, aside from the Columbia disaster, was it just, you know, reading a ton of books? 
Um, and also I wanted to ask you, I mean, in, in getting, I was also recently rejected from medical school after my first time. So I just wanted to ask you like, what, what type of hard work did you do in between getting that first rejection and getting accepted the second time? Do you think that really kind of, um, I don't know, separated yourself from everybody else and, and put you in the position to get in that second time? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Uh, sorry to hear that. Uh, but yeah, don't lose hope. You can, you can do this. So in answer to your first one, I have no idea what the first inspiration was. I think my parents must have made a mistake in letting me watch Star Trek when I was like you know, <laughs> less than one year old, something like that. But uh, the idea of exploring, the idea of going somewhere that no one's ever been, the idea of pushing the boundaries of whatever was possible was fascinating to me. And space was probably just the most was just the most visible one of those things. So. I always did that. I would go. I would go off and do, you know, like the the mountain climbing, or we'd go and uh, do scuba diving, getting involved in whatever expedition I could put myself to. Um, and space was the most visible and the most extreme, so I got very excited about that stuff. But I don't know what the first inspiration was. I, I I've tried to think on that one for years, and it never came to me. But in terms of doing the work to get um, uh, to get into med school after I was rejected the first time, what I did was call the med schools uh, saying, because at first, basically what it was is it was arrogance. I assumed that because I had gotten into college and because I had basically gotten whatever I needed to up until that point, that getting into med school would be easy. So I didn't really put the effort in when I was in college. Um, I had focused on other stuff, like I, I, I formed a, 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 a percussion group and did a lot of theater and played music and was very focused on like on history and psychology. So when I applied, I didn't have the, the, the grades that I would need to get into med school. Um, and I didn't think that would be a problem, which of course it was. So I called the med schools after this and said, well, what did I do wrong? How do I, how do I improve my, my, uh, my chances? And they, and they gave me a pretty candid answer and said, well, you know, your grades weren't that great. We're not sure that you can handle the workload. So I said, well, yeah, I can handle that workload. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, and I, I decided that what I would do is find ways to prove whatever the way I could do to prove that I could do that work. So I did a post back program that I had found uh, at Drexel and basically put a ton of effort into the program while I was there. So I um, forced myself to study with, I found a group of people to study with, and we spent a lot of time putting effort in doing the work because what I was told I needed to do was demonstrate that I could do the med school work. So I did that, got, um, you know, did the, got the equivalent of, uh, I don't, whatever the grade was, the, I, I guess it was the equivalent of like honors in the classes that I needed to honor. And then when I applied to med school after that, I, uh, was, I was given, I was accepted into a couple of places. So it was tough. Um, and I had to spend, a year doing extra work, but ultimately that was, um, that's what I did is I, I went and did a post back program, found some people to keep myself on track, uh, demonstrated to this group that said that demonstrated to the group what they needed to see. And then I, I, uh, I got accepted. Um, so it's possible, uh, but you have to figure out what it is, be honest with yourself, but what it is that's in your profile that doesn't work and go work to fix that problem. Sounds like being humble is, is a big, a big component of it and being willing to, you know, stay, take a step back and look at your own faults and being willing to work on yourself. Yep. Uh, it was for me. Yeah, that definitely was. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, being confident is helpful. Being arrogant is not. And right. I think arrogance will tend to work against almost anybody, especially in the field of medicine. So being humble, being willing to, uh, Look at your own faults, being willing to accept that you're not necessarily perfect in every way, um, and then being able to say, but also having the confidence to say, maybe not yet, but I can be, um, and building that. That's the that's the real, that's what I found was useful. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Well, thank you for that advice. I appreciate it. You bet. Good luck, man. Oh, Dr. Levin, I will respect your time. Thank you so much. There are a million amazing questions uh, in in the chat um, that uh, unfortunately we won't get to. Maybe we'll, we'll have to bring you on another time to uh, continue to sh share the knowledge. Um, I, I'm interested in 
this uh, Artemis mission. Do you know if it was named after the book? <laughs> the one, the, the who's the guy that Andy Ready Weir book? That book? Oh, no, no, it's Marsh, Andy yeah. Weir. Yeah, so our motto was the Ready yeah. Player One guy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, um, I don't think it was named after the book. It's it funny. It was named after the the, uh, but the book was named after the goddess of the moon. Uh, it was like uh-huh. a, we, the, they like uh, the space medicine, the space world likes Greek myths. Yes. Uh, so it was. I think it's Greek goddess of the moon and the Greek goddess of the hunt. Okay. So both the book and the program were named after that. They named after the same thing. There you go. Have you read the book? I have read the book. Yeah, it's a very good book. I like it. I, it's good. I, I, I loved it. Yeah. Book. Yeah, I loved it. Well, again, I, I appreciate you. Uh, thank you for your time, sharing your knowledge. Uh, it's amazing everything you're doing. I love space. I, I would have loved to have been an astronaut. Um, and uh, hey, been the a commercial doc- programs are out there, man. I know. Don't I know. Off. <laughs> uh, I, I have fun being a podcaster and uh, e-shadowing host, so uh, I can't beat this. Hey, well, but uh, thank you again. Thank you again so much for yeah, your no time. Problem. You're quite welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. This is a pleasure. Yep.